So in keeping with this theme of the dance, we already saw when we were with our wives in the same room together that the dance that we're a part of really is a two-step. There's something we're supposed to do in loving our wife like Christ loves the church. And then there's something she is supposed to do, which is to, um, you know, respect their, us, her husband. Not, not us, like we're all your wife's husband, but you know what I mean. Those of us that are husbands, to respect those of us that are husbands, to do those things. And, and, and looking at some of the questions that we're going to address in our final session together, I know for some of you on your heart is, well, what if she doesn't do that? What if she doesn't support me? What if she doesn't come alongside me? And we'll, we'll address that uh, when we come to the next session. But there also was a question that was given, and I didn't know that when I planned today's study. But one of the questions was from, from a wife sitting here, and so married to one of you. And, and the question was, what if my husband refuses to lead? And so what I want to talk about long before I saw that question is leading this dance. Because you do understand in a dance, somebody's got to lead. If, if you're both leading or nobody's leading, it's, it's as awkward as I describe with me just trying to dance by myself. Somebody has got to lead. Somebody has got to take the initiative. Someone has got to go forth. And men, it's you and I who God, not your pastor, not your friend, not your wife, who God is holding responsible to lead this relationship. That is not your friend's idea or your wife's idea. We can kind of look at them and say, why are you preaching at me? God Almighty says, I want you to lead this relationship. And I want to look just for a few minutes. I won't be long, but I want us to look at Isaac. And I want to see what made him such a great leader. And there are things that I think you and I can easily imp implement into our own marriages. And the first thing I want us to see is as this chapter opens up, it kind of gives us this genealogy, Abraham and Sarah have a son by the name of Isaac, and then we get to learn Isaac's story. Isaac's going to get married to Rebecca, and they're going to have Esau and Jacob, who we learned about this morning when he was married to a couple of women and all the problems that happened in that marriage. But, but this is the before story with his dad, Isaac. And before Jacob or Esau were ever born, we read of a problem there in the text. And the problem is that Rebecca is barren. She can't have children. And the first thing I see, the first thing I want you to notice, the first thing I want us to consider about Isaac being a leader, something we can implement in our lives, we must implement into our lives, is Isaac took his family in a different, distinct direction than what he learned from his parents. And what do I mean by that? Well, most of you know your Bible. So you know that Rebecca being barren, not able to have children, she's not the first one in the biblical story to deal with this, is she? Isaac's mom, before she had him, Sarah, was in the same predicament. Abraham and Sarah, his parents, could not have children. But do you remember how Abraham and Sarah dealt with that problem? Most of you do, obviously. I, I think, honestly, when you, when you read the story and just read it like it's actually happening, because it was, we, we read one chapter after another, we realize there's years between each of these stories. For years, God has been telling, first of all, just Abraham. Later, he'll tell Sarah a year before she becomes a mother. But up until that point, there's no record in the Bible of God ever talking to Sarah about them having children. But he talked to Abraham. And he'd say, Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. You are going to have so many kids, they'll be innumerable like the stars in the heaven or the sands on the sea. And no doubt, he would like we would do if you, if you were childless, he goes home to his wife and he says, babe, I just got the best news. I know I'm 75 and you're 60, but, but the reality is we're going to have kids someday. And that would be a tough conversation if you're 75 and 60. But it continued on, right? until well into the 80s and the 90s. God kept coming back every five, ten years or so and telling Abraham, I haven't changed my mind. You are going to be the father of many nations. And he would go home and tell his wife, we're going to have a baby someday. And I personally just wonder if Sarah got just tired of hearing that over and over again. Tired of thinking there was something lacking in her, which which physically there was, but, but it wasn't her fault. She didn't make this decision. She knows her husband desperately wants a kid. 
And so finally, maybe, maybe that was the, 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 the mindset behind it all, but we know what she did. She said, why don't you just take Hagar, my maidservant, why don't you have a child with her, and then we'll raise that child in the place so we can finally have a kid. And Abraham hears that and says, well, if that's what you want, babe. That is what I'm going to do. I'm a family man. I'm concerned with the wealth of our family. So if that's, if that's what you're suggesting, beautiful, that is what we're going to do. And it wasn't just a suggestion for Sarah. What you and I also need to key into is it was the way the culture back then operated. Obviously, in today's world, if you and your wife can't have children, you know, the option is adoption, the, you know, even with medical science and intro fertilization, like all the things that we have available to us today, obviously they didn't have back then. And none of us in our marriages, if you do, it, you probably want to book a counseling session, but, but none of your marriages, your wife is like, let's try a different girl and see if you can have a child with her. There is no right-thinking Christian woman that suggests that to you. I mean, amen, we're all on the same page. But in that culture... That was the norm. On those actual cuneiform tablets, though I love Pastor Sandy's uh, top 10 reasons to not be married to two wives. That was great. But on actual cuneiform tablets, the Nazu tablets, they found these marriage agreements between these couples who were married in ancient Babylon. And, and it was basically this. We're going to have children together. If you can't provide a child, it is your obligation, wife, to find me a second wife to be able to have children with. That was like in their marriage agreements in that culture. So Isaac, back to our story here in Genesis 25, not only has the example of his parents who decided to go outside of their marriage covenant and find another girl to have a baby with to deal with his wife's infertility, you also had a culture that said this is exactly the way that you are supposed to do it. This is what Isaac is facing, but Isaac makes the decision to be a leader, to lead his family like God wants all of us in the room to lead our families. And he decides to go a different direction than his parents, a different direction from the culture. We read it in the text. I don't know if you noticed it, but when he realized it's not just we're not together enough, when he realized his wife is barren, what did Isaac do? Isaac prayed. Isaac prayed. It's amazing that we never read that. I mean, Abraham prayed about a lot of stuff, but we never read him putting hands on his wife, Sarah, and say, God, would you open up her womb? God, would you intervene in this? Would you do something amazing? As great as Abraham was, as the father of the faithful that he was, we never read him doing this. Isaac didn't have this example in his father. He chose to take his family in a different direction. And men, that's something as a leader all of us can implement. Because I think all of us, because we live in the real world, a lot of us had poor examples growing up. You know, your, your father, your grandfather wouldn't be caught dead in a marriage conference. Like, that. <laughs> She needs to get over her unhappiness. Like that's, that's a lot of our, our father's and our, our grandfather's mentality. And, 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 and I don't know your story, but let me share with you mine. So my dad, I, I'm not a pastor's kid. My dad doesn't pastor a church somewhere. My dad was a drug addict and a drug dealer. He spent lots of my young life in and out of prison for drug possession and drug dealing. Then somehow he moved to a different state, and the state didn't check with California records, and he became a drug counselor for kids. So he would have the kids come into his office, tell them they shouldn't be on drugs, put all of the drugs in his drawer, and then he would take all of their drugs until he got fired from that and went back into prison. When my parents divorced when I was five, I still remember the night my dad left. And I remember him just drunk out of his mind, coming into my room, grabbing me by the shirt, and he said to me, you're the reason I'm leaving this family. I was five years old. You're the reason I'm leaving this family. There's a lot of reasons I should make some psychologists lots of money. <laughs> my mother, God bless her, because she at least stayed with us and took care of us, but on the moral spectrum wasn't much better. 
we lived with so many men in my young adult life. I had many guys coming in and out of my life as my new stepdaddies, though they were never really married, and, and those kind of situations. And, 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 and even when she got saved, I remember, you know, she got saved. We, we were going to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa at the time, and, and uh, she saw Pastor Chuck did this movie against Halloween, why Halloween was bad. And my mom, as a brand new baby Christian, was so, like, impressed by that. She sat my sister and I down, and she says, we are no longer going trick-or-treating. We are not going to honor the satanic holiday. And, and she said, instead, though, what we're going to do is we're going to rent uh, Friday the 13th, 1 through 5, and we're going to have a, a marathon movie night at the house. And so instead of trick-or-treating, my Christian mom exposed me to killing and nudity and all that stuff that night as a good thing that God wanted her to do. That was literally my upbringing. And then as I became a teenager... I started writing to my dad because I wanted a relationship with him. I, the last time I saw him was when I was 12 years old. And so when I became a teenager, I started writing and reaching out to him and saying, hey, you know, I, I, really, want, I really want a relationship with you. I, I know you're gone. And, and I, I, I remember even as a teenager thinking, I hope you can forgive me forever. Why are you left us because of me? Because that's what I remember. My dad shaking me saying, you're the reason we're leaving. I'm leaving. And uh, just trying to apologize, and, and I'd always, I'd always would give the letter to my mom and say, "Can you just send it? I don't, I don't even know where my dad lives. Can you send it where you think he lives?" And, and, uh, and then always getting them back just unopened, and her telling me, "Your dad doesn't want a relationship with you." I turned forty five years ago, and on my fortieth birthday, there was a letter at the church I pastor out in Indio, and it was a letter from my father, and the letter said. Your, dad, your granddad died of prostate cancer. I currently have prostate cancer. I know you just turned 40. You better get checked so you don't die too. And then he left his phone number at the bottom of the letter. I hadn't heard from him in 28 years. And I opened up that letter and picked up the phone and he answered. And I said, hey dad, for the first time in 28 years. And at the time I was... It, stage four lymphoma. So I was like, well, I got good news and bad news. <laughs> good news is they've checked me for all cancers. I do not have prostate cancer. Bad news is I'm dying of, of, of lymphoma. Please pray for me. Hopefully I'll get better. But, but, but the reality was is we just started talking. And when I went out to see him, I found out that he never got any of those letters. That he had decided to turn his life around wanted to be in my life when I was 16, 17 years old. And my mom, and again, her motives, she's, she's done the best job she can with the tools she was given, but wanted to protect me from him and so kept me from him. And so then I had to deal with the struggle of like, my mom's been lying to me my entire life. That's where I come from. I got saved because my mom would drop me off at Calvary Costa Mesa because she heard they had free babysitting and she needed a night away from me and my sister. And she would do that multiple times a week. And she trusted because she was, a, she was never a part of it, but she was there when the Jesus movement was happening. And she heard that was a safe place where people loved Jesus. So she dropped her kids off there. So when I got tired of children's ministry, I wandered in the back of the sanctuary and heard this old guy, this old bald guy preaching, preaching the gospel. And it happened so frequently, I would also go on Monday nights when Greg Laurie back then was preaching on Monday nights. And Greg Laurie, I remember to this day, he's like, you're either for God or you're against God. And I'm like a 14-year-old kid, and I'm like, I don't want to be against God. That sounds like a bad thing to be. So if you don't want to be against God, you come forward. That's literally how my relationship with God started. I don't want to be on his bad side. And I came forward and gave my life to the Lord, and that is where it started. And from that, from that moment forward, I go home, and I'm like, Mom, I know you say we're Christians. I don't think we are. And, I, and like witness to my mom, and then my mom got saved, and my grandparents got saved, and my whole family got saved. God was so gracious to take me from this totally backwards family and say, I'm going to have you have Calvary Costa Mesa do your babysitting. And I'm going to have your, the, the speaker at your babysitter be Pastor Chuck and Greg Laurie and all these different guys because God took my life in a different direction. But you understand, there had to be a decision on my part that I'm not going to emulate what I saw emulated for me in my life. My sister, who I love with all my heart, but, but she, she's, she's turned her back on the Lord and gone the same way as, as, as her father before her and her mother for that season of her life. All of us have a decision. 
you have family, you have upbringings, you have things that you have been given, but you have to make a decision. I am not a follower, I am a leader. I want to take my family in a completely different direction. And men, it's possible. And again, you might say, well, I don't know. Again, I wasn't raised by people who knew how to pray. I wasn't raised by people who knew these things. And I hear you, friends. Neither was I. Neither was I. And I feel like, to use a sports illustration that most of us can understand, I feel like most of the time I've been starting off in my own end zone. Meaning, I can sense in my own body. I, I, I told you in the groups about the Diet Coke thing. Like, the reason my wife forbids me to drink Diet Coke is like some of you that occasionally have a Diet Coke. That wasn't my relationship with Diet Coke. It was, it was 80 to 100 ounces a day of Diet Coke for 20 years. I just, I, I was never into alcohol or drugs because I didn't want to be like my dad, but I was addicted to, <laughs> to caffeine and Diet Coke. I would have so much of it. I sensed that in my, in my body. I sensed the draw to things I, I remember watching with my mom when I was a little kid, just egging on my heart, even as a full-grown adult. But we have to make a decision. That's not the direction I'm going. You might feel like you're deep in your end zone, but you know what? Football's about to start, so here's where I'm at with my illustrations today. <laughs> you can make a decision today to take that ball, and even though you're starting deep in your own zone, you can advance it to midfield. You can say, I'm going to make the choices to advance this ball to midfield. Yes, it might be differently than, than David Rosales raises his kids. It might be different than the, the marriage of Pastor Sandy Adams. But, but for me, I can advance the ball to midfield. And I can teach my kids to walk with Jesus. And those kids, the next generation, they can take it into the red zone. They can advance the ball to take it in the red zone. And then our grandkids can change the world. This is the reality of what can happen. The nation of Israel was formed in three generations. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And though each of them had setbacks, and each of them weren't perfect by any stretch of the means, each of them were committed to advance that ball. And they go from Abraham, who came from an idol-worshiping nation, Literally, there's records of his dad making idols that the people of Ur would be able to worship. So that they made their money from idol formation. That's where Abraham was from. And in three generations, you have Jacob with 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel and the people of God are born. But each of those men, each of those men, though they weren't perfect, though they made their own mistakes, they were committed to move the ball forward from where the generation before them had been. They were committed to say, I'm going to teach the next generation more than I was taught. I'm going to teach them how to love their God like I was never taught and to watch them have success. Most of you know, because again, most of this isn't just my story, it's your story. And some of you watch your kids do things that you couldn't even, you couldn't even imagine. Some of you, my son has been leading worship here on occasion, especially at youth things. And, and, and I, I get so blessed by that to see my 19-year-old boy. And I think back to the crazy things going on in here in my heart when I was 19. And here he is, like dedicated to lead people in worship. And I think, God, it's working. It's working as much as the enemy loves to beat me up about the weird things that still swim around in my heart. And I'll just be, I'll just be as transparent as possible with you guys. Because I don't want you to think, I have figured it out and you haven't. There are weird, sinful things that are constantly swimming around in here. And I am so grateful that God saved me, that God has called me, and that I'm able to take my children and just teach them more than I was ever taught. And my heart and my hope is that someday, someday my grandkids, if God tarries that long, can, that my kids can build on what I taught them and the third generation can change the world. But none of that happens if we decide to stay in our own end zone. None of that happens if we go, yeah, you know, my dad was crazy and I'm just like him and I'm just going to make the decisions he made. I'm just going to do exactly what he did. The enemy will stop everything in your family right at that stage. A leader, how do we lead this dance? We decide to not be like the generations that went before us.
to build and do something totally different. Isaac does. His father and the culture all around him says, well, you should go ahead and just find a new girl to have a wife with, to have kids with. He says, no, instead, I am going to pray for my wife. And a leader, leaders in this room, where the whole culture says, you're being ignored by your wife. Sex is anything and everything but what Pastor Sandy described in there. So what, is, what does the culture tell you? It tells you to turn to pornography. It tells you to, you know, you're, 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 you're just, you're, you need to pour into your work, pour into your kids, forget about this marriage. That is what the culture says. And the culture would not bat an eye if that's the direction you go. But we don't want to be what the culture wants us to be. We want to be godly men. We want to lead our families. And so we've got to take them in a different direction. Isaac prays, and God listens to the voice of his wife. He listens to his voice, and he opens up his wife's womb, and she gets pregnant. Now, now watch this. So then she's having a rough pregnancy because she doesn't know she's got two twin boys inside there. And God tells her eventually, you got two nations in your womb. That does sound like a problem. But what God meant was, you got these two boys who will become two nations who will not get along with each other. But that started, as most of you know, in the womb. They were fighting in the womb. So she says, Lord, what's going on? But I want you to see this. When Rebecca's having a problem with her pregnancy, what does Rebecca do? She, she prays. Now again, Rebecca is from the fame, same family that Abraham and Sarah were from, meaning she grew up pagan too. She grew up with no heart for God, no, no heart to see him lifted up in her family, no, no knowledge to pray over things. What I want you to see, men, is Isaac is rubbing off on Rebecca. He prays to deal with the problem, and then she's got a problem in her womb, and she prays too. And again, another great reason, another, another reason we have to be leaders is God is counting on you not only to take your family in a different direction, but he's counting on you to model things for your wife that can help her grow in her relationship with the Lord. I realize most of us in the room, we don't want to get into a spirituality contest with our wife. Most of us don't. Most of us are like, if, if God's in heaven, like, let's see, I get to let one in. Is it going to be Jason or is it going to be Christy? I, I, I know it won't be, and I pray it won't be down to that, because that would be an easy choice for the Lord. <laughs> the Lord's like, get out of here. Who are you kidding? And he would bring Christy right on in. I don't want to get into a spirituality contest with my wife. And most of you can agree. I know there's a few of you. There's a few of you who your marriage is tough because your wife isn't wanting to serve Jesus. She isn't wanting to go for it. She isn't wanting to do things spiritually in your marriage. I know that's existing in this room. But for the vast majority, I know we know that, man, our, our wives, man, they, they've got it figured out. It's we that are lagging behind. But that is still no excuse for you and I to model biblical things for our wives. You know, I kind of I get a sad thrill Every time a husband comes into my counseling office and complains about his wife, oh, she's this way. Oh, she doesn't love me. Oh, she doesn't do it. Well, there's no, there's no, nothing to relate to me. And I, I just let him go on and on and on for a little while. Just let him get it out. Get it all out. Get it all out. And I say, wow, really, really? And I turn him in the Bible to 1 Corinthians 11. And I turn him there, and in 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, it says that woman is the glory of man. I said, do you, know, do you know what says that? Do you know what says that the woman is the glory of man? And, and they usually respond, I didn't know that. Yeah, add that to the list. She isn't very glorious. She is not glorifying me. And I go, oh, 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 oh. Well, the Greek, another literal translation of that is woman is a reflection of man. She's reflecting you, bro. Then they usually run out mad. But it, it, it cuts down on my counseling. It's really good. It's really good. <laughs> I'm like, all right. <laughs> but there's a truth to it. Just like I shared with, with, with when we were all combined, that, that our wives play a huge role in helping us become who we are. The opposite's also true. You play a huge role on who your wife becomes. 
And, and if you look at your wife, and if I just, you, I don't want to show a hand, it's just a moment between you and the Lord. If you look at your wife and there's a deep dissatisfaction with who she is spiritually, a deep dissatisfaction in how she handles things, how she does things, because you are leaders, men, I'm challenging you to turn that mirror around and saying, God, what is it about me that she's reflecting that I don't like? How can I grow? How can I mature? How can I do what I need to do to reflect something better for her to reflect back? And we'll get in the question time, what do we do if she never ever responds? We'll get to that. But the reality is, this needs to be our goal. Because the same verse that says, woman is the glory of man or the reflection of man, it also says that you and I, we're reflecting something too. We're reflecting God. But, but here's the difference in that. Whereas we're always around our wife, so she's naturally going to pick up some things about us that we're reflecting. You and I have to make a choice to reflect the Lord in our lives. We have to make a choice to be in the presence of God. You know, it's going to go on to say about Jacob and Esau. It describes them in the verses we just read. They're, they were physically super different, right? I mean, Esau was covered in red hair. He looked like baby Elmo when he was born. And, and just, you know, and Jacob was smooth skinned. And Esau loved to be hunting in the field. And that's why his daddy loved him. And, and, and of course, Jacob loved to be in the tent, kind of reading books and cooking meals. And that's why his mama loved him. And they were just two different boys. But it was more than physicality. And it was more than just what they loved to do with their free time. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, it describes Esau, and it says, we don't want to be like him, and it says there in Hebrews 11, sorry, 12, 14, it says that he was a profane man. That the main difference between Jacob and Esau, they were both struggle with sin, they both had a lot of issues, but Esau was profane, and that Greek word translated in English as profane, it literally means outside the sanctuary. Esau was outside of the sanctuary. In context, it means one that never took time to build a sanctuary in his heart. The main difference between Jacob and Esau wasn't how they looked. That was different. It wasn't what they liked to do with free time. Is that Jacob, with all of his sin and all of his issues and all of his problems, eventually in his life took time to build an altar in his heart. A place from which God could communicate to him. He could pour out his heart and become a different guy. And Esau never did. It was the same thing with David. I mean, we all love King David, right? The greatest king Israel ever had. The king to which all kings in Israel history are ever forever measured against. David, a man, God says, a man after my own heart. But then you become a Bible student, right? And you actually read the Bible. And you're like, how can you even say that? Because David has some issues, right? I mean, David was a compulsive liar. He is a compulsive liar as you read through the story. Secondly, he's got a little bit of a woman problem, wouldn't you say? Just a little bit. I mean, we all know about Bathsheba. We got that. But before Bathsheba, he's got nine wives and a stable of concubines, which are basically women that you financially take care of and provide sexual services for you. Let's be honest about what they are. I look at that and go, huh. And then, yeah, there was the Bathsheba thing. And on top of that, he murders Uriah. He actually puts him in the front of the battle and then tells Joab to pull the troops back so Uriah will die. How can that guy be a man after God's own heart? Well, I look at it and I learn two things about David. I, I, I see that David, with all of his sin and all of his struggles and all of his shortcomings, David, number one, was never an idolater. Unlike what his son struggled with, he was never an idolater. There was one true God that he would serve. He didn't always do what's right. He didn't always follow what he wanted to. But he always knew there was one God. He was not an idolater. And then secondly, he was clearly a man who allowed God to build an altar in his heart. We read his songbook. The book of Psalms is David pouring out his heart. And oftentimes, when you, when you know the story of, 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 especially, you know, the stories in 2 Samuel, and you read them next to David's Psalms, you realize that a lot of the Psalms he wrote, he's just crying out to God saying, God, this is not who I am. I am not really a man of purity. I'm not really a man of character. But that's who I want to be. He's crying out to God from the altar that's been built in his heart. God, I need you to change me and make me into the man 
that you and the nation of Israel deserves. And this gives me great hope for a loser like me. But what's really important is that I'm working on an altar built right here. I'm not perfect, and I know you aren't either. I struggle with things in my mind and my heart. There's an altar right here where I can go to the Lord and I can say, God, that needs to die in my heart. My wife and my kids and what you've entrusted me with ministry is too important for that to ever go past weird thoughts that come into my mind. God, I need you to kill that kind of stuff in my life. I need you to make me into the man of God you need me to be. And that, that altar gets built then as we, as we take the time. Look, I know we all pray. You know, the food comes out. You get your double-double. Oh, yeah. And you're like, thank you, Jesus. Bless this food. Help the calories to not kill me. Help it relate to me like I did when I was 20, eating double-doubles. Come on, Lord. <laughs> we pray. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about building an altar of prayer. We have a moment where you can come with the Lord. Sometime daily you come to him and just pour out your heart. Our wives are desperately wanting us to be leaders. How is it going to happen? We are men to decide, I want an altar of prayer in my life. We're so quick when work goes sideways and our marriage goes sideways. We're so quick to call friends and family and whine and complain. And, 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 and Listen, you've got to talk to somebody. I get that. But we spend so much time talking to people who cannot change the situation. You have a relationship with the living God who said, let there be light, and there was. Who said, stop to the oceans here, and they did. Somebody who created something out of nothing. The problems at work, the problems in your marriage are not too big for God. They're too big for you. They're not too big for God. So cry out, God, have this altar of prayer. Have this altar to the word of God. I know you all study the Bible. Most of you go to Calvary Chapel. Chino Valley, you're a well-taught, you're sitting and listening to a Bible study right now. But I, pr I pray your relationship with God's word is not just on Sunday mornings, maybe Wednesday nights occasionally, maybe, may maybe a, a conference every once in a while. And the reason it's so important, listen, I'm not trying to, this is how you make God love you. This is how to get more saved. Forget that. You are saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and your simple belief in it. And God loves you more than you can possibly understand no matter what you do. This isn't about making God love you. This isn't making you more saved. This is the fact that I don't want to be profane. And I know you don't want to be either. I don't want to be outside the sanctuary. I want an altar built in my heart. And so I need a relationship with God's word because the world is constantly preaching a sermon. Amen? It is constantly preaching a sermon. And I need the truth to wash over all of that, to cleanse my mind and get my heart back on track with God. I need an altar of prayer. I need an altar uh, to the word of God. I need an altar of worship. We all worship. Again, we show up at church, and they do it every time. There's always a few songs. We clap when they're good. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a time to, to be on, I mean, the, the, the worship team back where I get to pastor, they, they did a phenomenal job. But honestly, sometimes sanctuary worship, it, 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 sometimes it's great, but it's not always the best for me. For me, it's because I'm always thinking about, oh, that, that point didn't work well in the first service, so i got to change it for second service, and, and then hopefully by third service I'll get it done. <laughs> like, like this, is, this is what's going on in my mind when everybody else around me is like, I love you, Jesus. I'm like, squirrel. Like, I, I'm so distracted. So it's not often sanctuary worship that's the best, but I'm telling you, when some song comes on when I'm driving somewhere and it hits right where I need to hit, there's, there's times I just have to pull over the car. And people are looking at me and they're like, what is he on? Well, it's Jesus and it's better than whatever you're on. I'm telling you that. I need an altar of worship, an altar of prayer, an altar of the word of God. Because I don't want to be profane. And then I, I want to end with this. I don't know where you are at today. But I know with all my heart, God can make you a totally different person. A totally different person. And I know that because what we were talking about in the, in the joint study that I got to do, you know, when Paul, before he tells husbands how to be, and he says, you be filled with the Spirit, you remember how life-changing the Spirit has been in people's lives before? I mean, you get, you get 
we, we always lift up these apostles like they were these great guys, and they were eventually. But the night Jesus was betrayed and the night before he was crucified, you remember what Peter was doing, right? He was denying him three times. A little girl, hey, aren't you a disciple? He's like, no. I think you are. No, I never even knew the man. No, I saw you with him. And Peter's like, bleep, 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 we. What? Same guy, same guy, 50 days later, stands up in front of a 3,000, not little girls, but men with swords and clubs. Not 3,000, that's how many I got saved. Thousands. And he says, Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, has become both Lord and Christ. You need to get saved and get baptized today. And thousands do. Where did that courage come from? What kind of class did he take? He didn't take a class. It was the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down and changed him into a man of courage and a man of purpose and a man that could be used by God. Same thing with, with the Apostle John. The Apostle John, before he dies, is known as the Apostle of Love because he was the last living apostle. You guys know this. And then the churches would invite him to speak. Can you imagine that? Guest speaker, the Apostle John. Do I sign up for that? And people would walk for miles to come hear John speak. And he was an old, old man, and he'd get up on the platform, and he'd say, my little children, love one another. And he'd sit back down. Like, you didn't know pastors could preach five, five word sermons. We can't anymore. But, but John would. And they would say, no, 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 I walked for two days. Where's the meat? Where, where's, the, where's the good stuff? And he would get back up, and he'd say, this is the meat. Love one another. He became known as the apostle of love. But let's not forget, whoop, let's run the clock back. Luke chapter 9, they're all in Samaria. The Samaritans aren't listening. So same dude says, hey, Jesus, could we actually pray and call fire down from heaven to burn these people that aren't listening to us? I know we all have people we disagree with, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say, there's probably only a few of you, because I know there's a few of you. Come on now, come on, there's a few of you. The most of us have never prayed death upon the person that, that is frustrating us a little bit. We Accidents, maybe, but not death. John literally prays, I want to set this guy, these guys on fire. That's how you know you have a little bit of an anger problem. How does that guy become the apostle of love? It wasn't a class. It was the power of the Holy Spirit to change him. I'm telling you, men, I don't know where you are today. I know many of us have started out deep in our own end zone. We just don't know what's going to work. And our, our wives, God bless them, they're, they're, they, they are so quick to sometimes point out the failures and how we don't measure up and how we're not going to get it. And, and, we, and sometimes the enemy is right there to say, yeah, you should just give up. But I'm here to tell you today what God has for you is worth you making a decision today. I will not give up. I will be the leader of this family and this relationship. And though I have no business being this leader, I have no business for the crazy stuff going on in my heart, the God that I serve can take a man who had no courage in front of a little girl and make him the preacher of Pentecost. The God that I can serve can make a man that was so angry, he prayed that God would set people on fire and make him an apostle that was known for his love. And that same God that can turn you with your lust and your lying and your struggle and your bitterness and you not being compassionate toward your wife and as you say, God, I am deciding to make a difference today. I'm deciding to take my family and my life in a completely different direction. That same God God can transform you into somebody who God looks at you one day and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in these things I entrusted to you. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many. You decided I will not stay in this end zone. I'm going to move the ball by the power of the Holy Spirit to where God wants me to be, and I'm going to let God change me into a different man. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word for us today. And I just pray. I pray for these guys. Lord, being one of them, I know there are times where, God, our wives, as, as amazing as they are sometimes, God, that sometimes there can be so much discouragement. 
we know that most of them are so spiritual and they know you and we don't measure up at a lot of times. And, and sometimes when they're in a moment of the flesh, they love to point that out. But God, I pray that we'd realize that is not, that is not how you feel about us. Your word is so clear, Lord, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. But God, you do want us to hear truth. You do want us to hear truth. That we need to be leaders. Someone has to lead this dance. And you have called it to be us. And so God, we want to lead this relationship spiritually. We want to go to you and ask you to fill us with your spirit. To turn us into different men. Different than our character and our nature. Different especially than some of the examples we had growing up. And what the culture is preaching around us. God, we want to be different. and We want to be one that can reflect beautiful, godly things to our spouse that she can reflect you and that she can become all that she wants to be. So God, forgive our sin, forgive our shortcomings, forgive our inadequacies. God, I pray something would be born in us today that we would be determined to be godly men. And we pray that together in Jesus' name, amen.